Time Science will present our special feature for this evening on Where Are Our Youth? Today, Leon and Rochelle Ferguson, along with Cynthia Garba, will lead the 10-minute discourse. Time Signs is a 10-year-old Seventh-day Adventist youth and young adult-oriented ministry that provides a platform for individuals to develop and share their faith in Jesus, particularly through, particularly through the lens of contemporary issues and events that affirm the relevance and inspiration of scripture and the three angels' messages of Revelation chapter 14. Time Science is involved in small and large Bible study series and discussions, production of Bible study guides, presentations in churches, as well as youth camps. This ministry captures the spirit of Ecclesiastes 12, verse 1. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. Welcome, Time Science. Uh, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. And thank you for having us, um, Pastor Darren Miller. And um, uh, Darren Hill, sorry. <laughs> And, um, and it is a pleasure to be with you this evening. Uh, with me is, is um, Cynthia Garbutt, um coming to us all the way from Belize. <laughs> and she'll be uh, sharing in this uh, small presentation uh, that we have here for you. And we've captioned this um, small discourse, um, House on Sand. And I'm trying to ensure that I uh, can share the full screen here. Post on sand, where is where are our youth? And um, as we talk about youth attrition um, in the church and the attrition rate um, overall, um, it's very interesting and it's very it's a very interesting topic and it's very important for us to understand and to appreciate uh, something that Jesus said in um, in Matthew chapter seven, uh, twenty six and twenty seven. And without reading both chapter both verses, um, I have underscored the word floods. You know. Um, the analogy basically is that if a house is built on sand, um, then before the floods even come, comes, that house is is destined to fall. And um, and the focus of the discussion is really to uh, we have we cannot be done in ten minutes really, <laughs> but is really to investigate and to look carefully at what are the causes of youth attrition. Uh, when we talk about our Seventh-day Adventist churches, and not only in our churches, but in, our, in, in churches right across um, Christendom, in Protestant churches and otherwise, we find this um, un, un, unfavorable uh, phenomenon. Um, the bottom line is that we believe that young people uh, should have a solid foundation, have to have a solid foundation in Christ if they are to stand for and remain with him. And even as we look at the attrition, uh, perhaps uh, said to have been increased or increasing over the course of this global pandemic, uh, we realize that when the flood of pandemics come, it probably only exposes what was already afoot. And so we want to be sharing um, just uh, a few points with you on this subject to, uh, to look at this issue uh, more, uh, more deeply if we can and also to share some gems as how we can uh, approach it as a church, how we can uh, resolve it if, there, if that is possible. Because what we have seen is that even though there has been increases in church activities and programs, it has not necessarily uh, resulted in a decrease or a slowing down of the attrition rate. So Cynthia uh, is here with me and we'll just be dialoguing uh, for the next nine minutes <laughs> as we talk about this topic. Cynthia. Yeah, like we said, it's, this is a big issue and we, you know, we cannot exhaust it in 10 minutes, but we're going to try to speed through it. And so we ask that you just, you know, stay with us as we go through it. The first thing that we could see here, Leon gave a little overview um, here, uh, up to approximately 70% of young people will leave the church after high school. And that is in and of itself alarming. Only about two out of 10 will stay involved. Right, we could get to our first point. So we came up with a few points from research and you know on our own, um, based on careful observation. And the first thing that we found um, that one of the issues were that many Christian churches, including our estate churches, is very they're very program oriented, and so we have a lot of programs. Whereas in other religious groups, such as um, Islam or the Muslim community, they're very outcome um, 
just oriented. So we have a lot of programs in Adventism and we always try to make it more attractive, more and more entertaining. Let's make it as close as possible to the to, to, to fun stuff um, without trying to lose our essence. And what I would say to that, you know, when I think of it, I consider as parents giving our children what bright colored candy because the children like it rather than giving them spinach and broccoli because we might think that spinach and broccoli is unpalatable but that's the that's the sort of stuff that will keep them healthy all right and then we have our second point and of course if you um if you if you agree with anything or you want to contribute you could go ahead and put that in the chat there as well all right um and then leon Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, go ahead. Right, I <clears throat> I think my voice was going in and out, but I was just gonna say, just, <laughs> just to support the point that you just made, that um, some of the statistics that we have reviewed um, have actually shown uh, that, and this is from the Pew Research Center, for example, that has shown that there has been a correspond, well, not corresponding, but there has been a decrease, and this is just up to 2011, right? a decrease in persons identifying as Christian. And this is in North America, America and uh, Canada. Uh, whereas there has been an increase um, in the number of persons identifying as members of other religions and also a 20% increase in persons identifying as not being a part of any religion. So outside of in the church itself, this is what is happening in the wider uh, society. And that has its very key impact. So it is very um, interesting that you mentioned uh, that because when we look at um, the increase in other religions, what was also mentioned um, here in Ontario Conference is that Christianity is an unattractive among youth and millennials. But then at the same time, Islam, for example, is growing rapidly among youth and millennials. So it's quite interesting that you just pointed out um, one of those things that we have discussed which is uh, that our, our churches are oftentimes program oriented. Um, and when we even, not to use, um, not to favor Islam per se, but just to, 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 to refer to it, to make these five points, right? Um, the, the second one I believe you mentioned was that Islam is extremely penetrative. Did you, did you talk about um, being penetrative and serious with the messaging? Is that the second one you mentioned? Yeah, you go ahead. Yeah, you go ahead on that one. Oh, okay. All right. So I, I didn't want to 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 jump over, but yeah, so that's one of the other things, right? By comparison. So if we just use Islam, which is growing among you, meanwhile, young people are leaving the Seventh-day Adventist Church and other Protestant churches. One of the things that we realize is that they are extremely serious and penetrative about their messaging. Um, while in the Adventist church and in Christian churches, we're very uh, frivolous when it comes to truth. Sometimes you go to the pulpit to pray, to preach, and um, persons have to be very cautious about what they say. But we recognize that in the religions that do not have the truth, but they are growing, they have taken a very methodical and strategic uh, approach towards ensuring that these messages are are, are understood and are accepted. Um, and 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 just a, just a quick example. For example, when we talk about church participation versus um, embracing the message fully, um, a friend of mine mentioned going to a Muslim home where he works here in Canada, and uh, the parents were not there. And even though they were there at workmen as workmen, the 12-year-old was the oldest one with two other younger children. And when it touched noon. All of them just gathered in the living area and they all bowed down to pray without their parents being there. We congratulate ourselves when our children pray in church, but that's just an example of how they ensure that their children um, adopt this. Do we, should, is that what the Bible says, for example, Cynthia, in Deuteronomy 6 about how we should approach um, ensuring that our children fully uh, accept the message? You know, when we consider the, the instruction given to the Israelites in Deuteronomy 6, you know, God is saying here, 
talk about these and teach teach your children diligently these precepts and these truths diligently um talk about it when they're going going out when they're coming in where it has front legs in front of your eyes have these truths ever before you and um if we are to be honest with ourselves as seventh day adventists many parents and many homes leave that sort of thing for sabbath morning and sabbath school Mm -hmm. um and so we are we really are not doing the best we're not setting up our children to be successful christians in that regard thank you so um just i leave the last one here for you but the, the other one here is that when we even look at Muslim, when it comes to doctrines and philosophies that erode Christian values, we realize that if you if you compare Islam to um, to Christianity, we find that Muslim parents they confront and they repel the attacks on the fundamental religious and personal values that they would have taught their children. But especially in these societies, um, the Christian parents by comparisons, tend to be very quiet and indifferent to these issues. And then one example that comes to mind in Bur is Birmingham, um, England, where uh, certain things were introduced into the school curriculum and the Muslim parents, they protested and they had to take it out of the school. Whereas here, we're like, ah, oh, we'll, we'll send our children anyway. That plays a role in eroding the values that would keep our children grounded and firm in faith. Right. Especially, and, and even, it's a double whammy because the parents will not protest attacks on the values, but neither will they very diligently teach these values and instill them into the children, which if you are not able to, to, to do away with certain curricula, curricula, then you, at least you are doing your part in your home. So, you know, we have a conundrum there. All right, and um, here's another um, point. Are you gonna go ahead? No, you can go ahead and then we'll All just right. wrap solutions all right we want we want to wrap up we want to talk about how you know because we only have a few moments left um many parents tend to believe or many churches tend to believe that we are not able to teach hard things or deep truths to our children because it's probably over their heads and you know in talking we have a quotation there that you can see on the screen and you can read it um there but essentially what it's saying is that if our children they're able to understand movie line plots and they're able to work apps that you can't work and they're able to pass um, standardized tests and, and, and do well in chemistry, then they are able to understand about Jesus. They're able to understand that doctrine as well. Absolutely. So what are some quick solutions um, that we can offer very quickly as our time is probably almost expired? One, uh, the home should be uh, the fundamental teaching ground and not the church. And you mentioned that, Cynthia, in terms of Deuteronomy chapter, um, chapter 6. But when we come back, perhaps at the next time, we will be able to delve into these. But maybe you could just run to number two and then we'll just alternate. All right. Parents need to be intentional in um, creating uh, in creating intentional parents need to become aware of the current popular thoughts and impression impressionable ideas influencing youth and then teach them from biblical perspective how to relate to these ideologies um another thing i'd like to really quickly number three says that we need to teach the church to be their brother's keepers teach young people to be their brother's keepers have peer accountability and as older ones or you know older ones in the church be mentors and effective mentors for young people because that is what is very essential for them. Absolutely. Um, also, second to lastly, <laughs> church needs to have direct conversations and good answers for pressing questions. This is what I, I found with young people. Um, they're like, well, listen, the, the, the things that I'm hearing every day, um, I, the church is not responding to those things. We need to have good responses that are solid. You, you can teach a cornerstone. I teach cornerstone at church. And the question that they will ask you, I'm telling you, at 15, 14, 13, you have to have good answers for them that are relevant and that are convicting. And finally, we have to build relationships with our young people. And we have to make sure that they understand that we are interested in their well-being first and not necessarily just merely their participation in church. So as we wrap, um, Ellen White has a quote um, here from the book Education and says that with such an army of workers or youth rightly trained might furnish how soon the message of the crucified, risen and soon coming savior might be carried to the world. And, um, and we leave that with you. So that has been uh, our quick chat from Time Signs. And um, we have our Bible study series on the way and you can get more information from us on our Facebook page and Instagram. Thank you so much.